Good morning, and thank you for attending this session entitled Sustainability in Orange County, Our Home for Life. My name is Daniel Kilpinen. I work with the Orange County Neighborhood Preservation and Revitalization Office. I thank you for being here. In this session, you will hear about Orange County's long-range vision and goals through the sustainability plan. This workshop will have a special focus on how basic sustainability concepts are being applied today and to address our long-term water, waste management, and energy needs. You can also learn how to receive grant funding for your specific community sustainability project. Alan Marshall has worked in Orange County for the past 19 years. He has held various positions in the county's Environmental Protection Division and now serves as assistant to the director for the Community Environmental and Development Services Department. Allen manages special projects for the nine divisions of CEDS and serves as sustainability director for the Our Home for Life Sustainability Plan. Will you please welcome Alan Marshall. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you've had uh, a great morning so far. I took a look at the agenda and it's kind of exciting for me too. I wanna to sit in on all the classes as well, even though I've been with the county. It almost said he said I was here for 90 years. Did it sound like that to you? <laughs> Is it 90 years? Oh, that's a long time. So, but it feels like it. I've been with the county a long time. Do I need to do anything else? Uh, just a reminder okay. that if you could please uh, hold your questions until the end of the, uh, towards the end of the session, that'll help us out. Thank you. Yep, I'm going to try to, I, got, I can see the, the uh, clock from here, and I'm going to try to reserve at least 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions. And then um, I'm here as long as you need if you want to talk to me you know, after this is over. So what I wanted to do today was to give you sort of an awareness level of the county's sustainability plan. It's a big plan. There's a lot in it. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to zing through a lot of information um, pretty much at the surface level. But our presentation today uh, really, it, it didn't start just now. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of history. Uh, in the mid 2000s, Orange County uh, started looking at its government operations and was thinking, well, we really need to be as responsible as we can be with our tax dollars and the money that we spend on our own infrastructure. And so we got some folks together and set out a plan for how, how can we reduce our fuel usage? Because we have a lot of fleet vehicles and we also have a lot of buildings. And so we, we were looking at ways to reduce our energy usage in those buildings, just kind of trying to be responsible uh, government. And so we set out some new parameters for the kinds of vehicles we were going to buy if we were going to replace a vehicle. And so uh, that was around 2005, 2006, 2007. We were operating under that plan uh, and, and making some gains there for a couple years. And then we started really seeing that these, these decisions that we were making and these thought processes that we had were saving us money. And so we started expanding that thought that return, we were seeing return on investment for some of these. And so our plan changed uh, from that internal plan to what we were calling orange to green. And what that was, was, you know, the green being money, you know, we're seeing the savings of these more sustainable or thoughtful, uh, you know, kind of work and life patterns that we had and uh, trying to make sure that we had availability of these green options, not just for us in Orange County, but for folks in our community. And then when Mayor Jacobs took office in 2010, she really believed that these sustainability programs were, were oops, I'm sorry, were wider than, um, than just the traditional energy saving, waste reduction programs. And she said, these are really community issues. And so she put together uh, an internal group of staff, a significant group of internal staff, and brought in a, a very, very diverse group of external stakeholders to assess what Orange County was doing and what our community was doing. What were the value points? What are our big, uh, you know, energy users or community programs? And, and, and set out the kind of the, the plan for creating a plan, okay? Because you can't just create a plan unless you know what you're doing. And so we took a year and a, 
created an assessment, and then took about six months and developed a 20-year plan for sustainability. And that's what we're operating under now that got, that got uh, accepted by our Board of County Commissioners in 2014. And it is a kind of a guideline and a, and a, and a guiding path for us for the future uh, for sustainability overall. And sustainability is a buzzword uh, that people use for different kinds of things. But there is, you'll, I think you'll see as we go through this presentation that everything here is a quality of life issue. And, uh, and that's, that's how I see our plan as a quality of life plan. So let me see if this is gonna work. Okay, so first we sat down to uh, defining what sustainability meant for Orange County. And uh, we were looking at you know, keeping Orange County a great place to live and work, which we know that it is, uh, now and for future generations. And that's, that's a pretty simple uh, discussion. Then kind of the, the verb of that is that it's an effort to plan for that health, that happiness and prosperity for future generations, set out that plan that enhances our quality of life, but with the prospect of that quality enhanced in the future for, for generations. So the bragging part of this uh, presentation is here on this slide. We've got amazing assets in Orange County. We have over 600 lakes and water bodies. We had last year 72 million tourists come to our area that, that, that wanted to come here from other places and recreate here and spend their money and, and visit. And to give you an idea of what that, uh, what that means, that's for every person in Orange County, that is eight, that's 80 tourists for every one person, just to give you a sense of what 72 million is. Um, we have over 100 parks in Orange County. We have 2,200 acres of natural resource parks, and these aren't the parks where you're gonna go play tennis. This is where you're gonna go out and you're gonna hear and experience nature on a hike. Uh, these are valuable areas that protect our wildlife resources, give them that refuge in our urbanizing area. We had 30, it says 33 on the screen, but it was actually 35 million, uh, the new, new number for 2017, 35 million hotel room nights. Again, that shows that value that people see in us from other areas of our country and other areas of the world to show you how special this area is. We have over 200 schools and 335 outdoor public art pieces. So now we're gonna start talking about the headwinds. You know, some of the reasons why we're doing this planning. As you can see on the screen there, populations are projected to increase. And you see the point where we are now at about 1.3 million. And you can see that projection is going nowhere but up. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that we need to plan for. So the challenges that we face as we further urbanize and grow there are pressures on our natural resources. That's probably not a surprise, water being one of the biggest. You have traffic congestion, which contributes to our air quality concerns. Our infrastructure, you see all that work on I-4 that's going on and all the work on, uh, on other projects. You know, stresses on our public facilities, you know, services that people need. Um, we have to make sure that we are engaging economic growth for these folks that are, that are coming here to live and work. Um, one of the more interesting and, and uh, relevant topics right now is affordable housing in Orange County. We're, we're, we're building a, a, a home product that's four to 5,000 square feet, and the majority of folks who are coming here or are living here and working here are having to stretch up too far to try to reach that housing product, and we're not building an, the appropriate product or at least a diversity of products for those. So, and the demands on our education system. So, <clears throat> our sustainability plan, uh, this group set out and they wanted to make sure that they hit all those important aspects of our life and our community. It's not just the environmental issues. You know, we have uh, focus areas for arts and culture, for the built environment, for civic engagement, community, um, education, mobility, and natural resources. Now, each of those focus areas, obviously, you've got to have goals. You've got to, you know, see where you're going. You have to have a desired output. You have to have strategies that are designed to at least encourage you to move towards those goals or to make you think outside of the box towards those goals. You have to have metrics. You have, in order to know where you're going, you've got to measure yourself. Um, and with baselines set at some particular point. If you're gonna have 20% reduction, you gotta decide where you're gonna start counting, otherwise, you're, uh, you can't measure yourself moving forward. 
So Mayor Jacobs, uh, with this daunting uh, task ahead of us, she jumped right out of the gate with funding. If you've got to have a plan, you've got to start with some funding. And they put $300 million uh, out front uh, to fund uh, the, the initial um, plan. And as you can see on there, the majority of that funding goes to some of the tougher things that we've got to deal with, and those are roadway improvements, okay? There's $200 million uh, set aside for that. As you go around that pie, you're looking at fire, res fire rescue and other capital projects, parks projects, housing initiatives, public uh, pedestrian safety projects. <clears throat> they all uh, at, at least initially got some funding, and it was great also that that $5 million was also apportioned for each of the district commissioners to set for their specific you know, value points in their district. Um, I won't go through too much, but it, the one good thing was when they created this plan, a lot of times plans get created and then somebody turns around and they go on the shelf, okay? This one required annual reporting. It keeps the feet to the fire, okay? And so uh, annual reporting, uh, we pull all those data points together each year, but what we've done to make it easy for everyone to see, because we could produce a report and it sits right there, there's one of the previous year's reports, but we wanted to get it onto a web resource. And so we created our web page and we baked the plan into it. Anybody can go on there at any time, pull up the strategies, see our progress, see how we're doing uh, on the metrics, good or bad, because uh, we have both, and, uh, and, and at least stay engaged and hopefully each of, those, each of those areas also provides points where you can get involved. <clears throat> so uh, let's dive into each of the focus areas. And uh, so community, uh, we're going to start out with the, the community focus area. And the community focus area is, I wouldn't say it's tough, but it's challenging because trying to define or encapsulate what community is, is, is not easy. It's a lot of things. There, there are a lot of things that create a successful community. And I think what the, what the members of the committee who put this together were realizing that a lot of the things in all the other focus areas had influences on the community focus area. And so what they did was provided mostly a matrix to say, if you're working on these other things, specific things within those focus areas, you're advancing our community uh, goals. But they did have some overarching desires for the, the community goal, and that was that our communities are safe, and that's, just, that's not necessarily just uh, you know, safety from crime. We're talking about safety from pollutants in our waters. Uh, we're looking at uh, you know, air quality issues, um, maybe fire rescue facilities, you know, the, the emergency type facilities. There's lots of things that go into just feeling safe within your communities. Healthy, we want healthy communities and that's access to healthy foods, that's access to, or, or maybe even bringing in healthcare programs into your communities. Ed, you know, information and education for, uh, for health and safety. Being connected, and that just, you know, that's not just these days, that always feels like it means just the tech connection, and that's a big part of it. You want to make sure that people are connected with technology, but they also need to be connected with their environment. You know, are you, when you're building your communities, are you making sure that people can get to natural areas, that you have walkability and, uh, you know, trails within your neighborhoods? There's a lot of things that contribute to connected uh, communities. <laughs> Overall, we want our communities to be thriving. I think we can probably all sit here and name a few communities in Orange County that we feel are really thriving. These, these are communities that are growing, okay? They're vibrant. They've got a lot of things going for them, and that's, this is kind of a, uh, kind of a catch-all, but that when everybody can kind of see what things are starting to kind of float the boats uh, of the neighborhoods. So let's grab your polling devices. Everybody has one, or if you don't have one, grab one in the seat next to you. I'm gonna throw a good softball question to you here first. So when I hit this, uh, everybody's gonna either pick A or B. And if you could hold it up a little bit, my little transmitter's right here and I wanna make sure that I'm, that I'm getting it. So the question is, have you ever attended the Orange County Hurricane Expo, okay? And um, Lori and I put uh, these questions in because this helps us in our work and figuring out where we need to focus on our, on our education programs. Okay, so I'm gonna stop it there. Um, so we've got about half and half here who have been to those. So 
the county offers a hurricane expo. Hopefully you went this year. Uh, these are very important uh, services that we, that we try to provide to our public out there because hurricanes are significant events. They're important events. They take a lot of information for people up front to be, uh, to be prepared for them, and they also take a lot of services afterwards, as we know, uh, reacting to them. And so we try to give as much information uh, to the public each year as possible. And um, just in that safety and preparedness, uh, we're opening up, continually opening up new fire stations, the three uh, more recent ones that have been planned. Uh, station 67, which is by University and UCF, is brand new. And I hear they're busy already. Um, so the county has uh, a number of mobile apps. We're trying to kind of reach people where they are, and just about everybody's at their phone at some point in the day. And we have apps that provide information for people, whether there's, let's say there's a controlled burn going somewhere or there's, a, or there's a fire somewhere that might be blowing smoke onto roads or we have a lake closure because of a sewage overflow or algae bloom or things like that. It brings you information that's helpful to you in your neighborhood or in, in other areas of the county that you might be traveling. Also, we have pulse point uh, apps and these, if, if, if someone is having a medical emergency, a heart attack, these apps will tell you in your area if there is an AED um, available, okay, for emergency response for that person, or if there are people that are trained in CPR. It just kind of brings, kind of opens up uh, the knowledge of the area around you to help respond to those emergencies. And there's a baby picture because who doesn't like baby pictures? So uh, moving now into the built environment uh, section. The built environment is important. Uh, when you talk about energy and the resources that go into uh, the production of energy. Our buildings are our number one energy user. And I might stress that once or twice because I want everybody to remember it. And that so if, if you're looking at uh, reducing energy usage in Orange County, you first have to look to our buildings. Um, and we want to make sure that as we are building and developing and redeveloping, that we're putting that thought beforehand into those plans to see are we building energy efficient buildings and are we building water efficient buildings understanding that the production of water uses a tremendous amount of energy there's energy either way uh, but we also have to conserve our water resources like I mentioned earlier those pressures of the uh, our community growing um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we are considering making our buildings as self-sufficient as possible and that comes from that renewable energy. If you put solar on some buildings, you are offsetting some of that power that is coming from those power plants and, and or all of it, depending on the size of the system that you're, uh, that you're putting on. But we need to start planning for these. We need to make sure the infrastructure is there to support these kinds of systems. Are we making our neighborhoods transit ready? Okay, we don't have a lot of, of transit here. We've got, you know, Sunrail coming through, but we don't we haven't matured yet into uh, a diverse transit um, area. And we have to start thinking about how we're going to do that. That takes long range planning and a lot of money. I mentioned infill and redevelopments, not just the greenfield development that we have to think about. We have to think about how, if we're gonna redevelop an area, let's do it better this time. We already know the things that we've done wrong, you know, whether it's stormwater issues, let's, let's do it better. And you have to create codes that work towards that goal. I mentioned the affordable and workforce housing, critically important that we, in our, as we move forward, that we start creating the strategies that allow for those housing units, you know, along with all the other uh, types of housing uh, that we have been traditionally building. So some of the metrics here, and so how hard they are to see on the screen there, but we measure the energy, uh, it's called the energy intensity of buildings to see, are we building buildings that take a lot of energy to run, okay? Or, or, or are we building better buildings that use less energy? And so right now we're still seeing that energy use intensity going up. So that might mean that we need to start talking to the folks who create building codes, you know, or, or other county, you know, mandates for, uh, for energy efficiency, you know? So but we're, we're watching the trends, you know, because we're constantly building, we know that. Um, one uh, definite plus point on the far side there, you'll see it says residential renewable energy capacity. So people, you guys are doing a great job with solar energy. We're seeing a doubling of the capacity of solar energy 
almost each year now. I'm waiting for the new numbers to come out. But um, those are, uh, that's really where a lot of this self-reliance, you want your buildings to be self-reliant. Um, there's nothing more empowering than, than being self-reliant. Community gardens, we'd like to see them continue to come up. That really throws back to that, that community section I talked about. That's where you're bringing people together for common goals, things they enjoy. Um, okay, question number two. It says, what one item would help you or your neighborhood the most? Opportunities for solar, energy efficiency programs, water saving technologies, safer, for walkable, bikeable roads, mass transit, or redevelopment and new business. No cheating. Almost everybody chimed in there. Okay. Well, I love that answer because that means that all of these points are important for us. Okay. So, you know, sometimes it's great to have all for one but we know that we have to work on a lot of different things. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is a, you know, commonly a very varied answer. So thank you very much for that. So I guess the winner was energy efficiency programs and number two was mass transit options. Okay, fantastic. I mentioned uh, the solar, uh, the residential solar. Orange County has been uh, supporting uh, a nonprofit group in Florida with solar co-ops and what that is is Instead of you, just a single person, in, uh, calling a solar company saying, hey, I want to put solar on my home, and you're going to pay whatever retail rate they've got, this is where we get groups of people together, educate them appropriately so they really understand what they're doing and the, and the mechanisms of solar, and then we bid that project out of 30 homes, and that's when the price starts to come down because solar companies want, they, they, you, you can imagine, they want to do 30 homes. They don't want to do just one. And they're willing to come down on that price because they want that bulk um, account. And so we've been able to take about 30% off the price of rooftop solar just with that aggregate. It's like Sam's Club for solar. And we've done four of them, or we're almost on the fourth in Orange County, and they have had tremendous results. You know, we'll, you know we're, we're, we're putting you know, 100 plus solar systems with each of these uh, solar co-ops and they're just gaining in popularity. So we're very happy about those. Our county utilities, just going down that line, our county utilities has tremendous amounts of information for water conservation on their web page and the strategies and systems you can put in or retrofit on your homes to, to conserve water. And remember, water equals energy as well. And energy equals money. It costs money to create energy. So money is really at the bottom of a, of a lot of these things, and we realized that years ago with that Orange to Green program. OCFL Atlas brings data about your communities together that you can see all the permits that are being pulled, all the development plans that are going on in your neighborhood. It's a great way to learn about um, what's going on. At the bottom there, it says Orange Code. Orange Code, we have a, been a, maybe a 60-year plan. All right, how, how long has our development code been around? Probably since six. The late 50s. Since the late 50s, so pretty, pretty long. And it's time for us uh, to build a new roadmap, a new way to develop forward. And so we have national firms that are bringing the success models from all over, and they're reworking our development uh, uh, codes to be able to facilitate these changes that we need to kind of move into uh, better development strategies. I'm not hitting my buttons here. Okay, so natural resources. Uh, we have, uh, I'm an ecologist. Um, I don't get to do that much anymore, uh, but these really hit me, uh, you know, at, in my heart. We're talking about, we want clean water for all. We want zero waste. Zero waste is tough, but what that really means is we always should be looking at our waste and figuring out what potential product or resource that could be for another company. Ultimately, you want a circular economy right here in Orange County. You want to buy things, use them, and then refurbish them, sell them again, okay? Sometimes things have to go to the landfill, but our goal should be is to figure out how to minimize that waste in that whole uh, circular stream. We preserve our open spaces, as I mentioned before, and we want to make sure that we're facilitating the growth of green products here in Orange County. So our, our metrics, we're always studying our water body uh, quality, and that goes up each year. We were just talking about Lake Holden a few minutes ago and how that has been transformed over the years. Uh, tr you know, tremendous success in that water body. 
Uh, our recycling rates, a challenge we've got right now, it's, it's the recycling, the success of our recycling is going down, and that's due to another class that I could teach for the next hour. Uh, but we're studying that and trying to get those numbers to go back up because they're going down right now uh, for some predictable and understandable reasons, but we've got to work on it. Greenhouse gas emissions, like I mentioned, that's sort of a polarizing term. The way I look at it is th this is, uh, th these are gases that we produce by our cars or our energy. Each one goes back to money. It takes money to create the energy. It takes money for the vehicles. And so any of these strategies that reduce these things ultimately save us money. And uh, that's a great bottom line to consider uh, some of these things. So we have air quality attainment, our access to parks. Um, you can see our municipal solid waste landfill, the amount that goes to the landfill is going down. Now that might be leveling out because we're having some trouble with recycling, but we're gonna keep watching that. Okay, question number three. Which of these uses, I'm gonna be proud of you guys if you get this right. Which of these uses more water in your home? Washing machine? Leaky toilet, landscape irrigation, or showers? Dun, 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 we need music. Hold them up if you haven't weighed in. Yep. Leaky toilet is in the lead. All right, I'm gonna give it one more second. If you haven't weighed in, put your hand up there and weigh in. Okay, so the answer is landscape irrigation. Yay. <laughs> Hands up for those landscape irrigation. Yay, yeah, right. <laughs> Boo, but yay, that you were, you know, congratulations. Okay, so when you look at this pie, and this pie chart comes from our utilities, 50% of our water we are pouring on our money 50% of our money we're pouring onto our lawns. I'm not saying that that's not a worthy effort to, to have, um, I, I mean, a, a beautiful yard and, uh, you know, is, is great for our, uh, you know, the economic benefit of our home. They're, they're very pleasing. They're great community elements. But what we can say is that there are better ways to get what you want without all the water and without all the fertilizer that goes in there as well. So you can look at the others. There's toilets and showers. I'm kind of going from the top there. You know, faucets, clothes washer, leaks. The leaky toilet really is a surprisingly high amount, and whoever was doing it was going in the right direction because inside the home, the leaky toilet is number one. If you hear those things, if you hear it cycling on, cycling on, it's got all day to do that. You don't realize it while you're working. It's doing it, doing it, doing it. There's a lot of water that's wasted that way. So util our utilities on our website can help you conserve water um, on, your, on your yards. And our agricultural extension office has professionals there that can teach you about Florida-friendly landscaping. I gave our Board of County Commissioners a, uh, a, a workshop on this as well. You can build your yard in a way that everybody here, if you look at the plant pallets out there, there's something for everybody there, and you can do it in a way that uses a lot less water because these are plants that like to live here. Most of the stuff that we buy from the stores and put in our yards are on life support the second you put it in the ground because it doesn't, it doesn't really want to live here and you're keeping it alive. So, um, so that's how we're, you know, some of the things that we're talking about. And those, once you start doing that across the county, that's a significant water savings. So now we're going to move into mobility. Um, we, our goals are that we have multiple transportation options. We really only have a few now. One is the car, for sure. It's about 80%. Um, <clears throat> you know, our, we want to make sure our land uses support these multimodal uh, operations, that our transportation system is safe, um, that we're putting investments, and what I mean by sustainable investments, that's recurring money, into our transportation, that we're producing clean and green transportation options, you know, so when we are, our bus services, to try to make them use the least, uh, least dirty fuels or potentially electric buses, as these technologies come out and get um, fairly secure, we need to be looking at those and, um, and safe and efficient freight movement. So. We have a lot of metrics there. We look at the distances people drive to work, how they drive to work, what vehicles they get to work in, what type of transportation systems, their headways of our bus routes, vehicle miles traveled is your distance into work. You know, what is the links in Sunrail ridership? You see on that one graph there, the Sunrail ridership is just kind of wavering along. I'm hoping as we open up those new stations in the south that that ridership goes up because that will also help bring, hopefully, maybe some of those weekend services and some of the other, I can't wait on Saturday to go to the Winter Park, you know, uh, 
market, you know, and just hop, I live a block and a half from it in Altamont Springs, and so I'm kind of looking forward to that. Are we, are we facilitating and using electric vehicles? Are we, are we getting our neighborhoods ready for these kinds of things? They are coming. Are we baking these into our development codes, you know, to make these, our homes, solar ready and, and electric car ready? So we have a lot of metrics that we're, that we're following. Okay, test time. Which of these have you used? Sunrail, Lynx bus service, juice bike, zip car, van pool, or none? Can you have more than one? Yes. Multiple answers are allowed. Good job on the Lynx bus. Great. OK. Take it from there. That's great. The Sunrail, I appreciate that. The, the, the bus service, excellent. Who's the zip car person? What's your hand up? Oh, Jacques. Okay. Jacques works for Orange County, works on these sustainability items. I would expect he should put his hand up. All right. Fantastic. So, uh, <clears throat> so alternative transportation, I mentioned before, you know, we should be looking at you know, the appropriate fuels for our bus services. Right now, there are some Lynx buses using compressed natural gas. Our school buses are using biodiesel. That kind of takes away from some of that uh, fossil fuel and is using at least some of that biological component in it. We want to expand those sunrail stations. We want to, you know, enhance our usage of, of electric vehicles and zip cars, which are, you know, kind of rental uh, cars that are around. Um, and development of a complete streets policy. Complete streets is where you really are designing a street with multiple functions with also with enhanced safety features in it. A good solid complete streets program can reduce pedestrian accidents by 60%. I think it might even be more than that, but it's, it's, it's an astounding amount um, just by properly designing your streets. So then we, now we head into education. Uh, this is a big part of our plan. Uh, we want to make sure that children are entering their schools ready to learn. You talk about the VPK programs, bringing kids in. Kids, kids can start learning very, very early. They're just, just sponges, and so we have to, we have to hit kids early. Um, it shows in, in their later development. We want to make sure that they're understanding and valuing our environment, that we're, we're looking at science and math and technology and engineering and also the A in STEAM is arts, okay? So we want to make sure that these programs are, are in our schools, um, that we have learning opportunities for all, for everyone. And that's from, from young to our, our older, uh, uh, you know, let's say even into for, uh, let's say, adult literacy classes, things like that. It's, it's not just our, our, uh, our younger school children. Um, we want to make sure that we're using our schools for the most purpose we can. They're, they can be community centers. You know, they don't just have to shut down at 4.30 when they close. And we want to make sure that they're operating sustainably. And one of the good things is that the county schools program has their own sustainability plan, and they're doing a tremendous job. So they, you can look, so we're looking at their energy consumption rates. We're looking at their number of field trips, nature field trips. There really are a lot of good metrics coming out of our, uh, our very award-winning school district. <coughs> Trying to speed up a little bit here. Okay, which of these programs have you seen or heard about? Orange County, War Conservation Calendar Contest, Green Schools Recognition, Junior Naturalist, Mills 50, Storm Drain Art Orlando, Art, something different, okay. I was excited when I saw one going up and I realized that was none of the above. Okay, very good, thanks everybody. Okay, so at least, we're, I'm, I'm very happy to see that people are going for, you know, to our, uh, our utilities page and, and, and hearing about these things. Um, those, those are, are great contests. We just sold one during uh, Building Safety Week. We had one of their, we had the kids paint one of our rain barrels and we sold it at the, uh, we raised a little bit of uh, money uh, for United Way for selling one of those uh, during Building Safety Month. So OCPS, uh, they won the Green Schools uh, District Award. Um, the County Utilities sponsors that art uh, con classes, which you, you, seems like you're uh, uh, aware of it. And our Environmental Protection Division, who my good friend Jacques here works, um, they have a junior naturalist program. It's very, very successful. 
Um, and art, you know, is a great opportunity. Let's see if I'm hitting my buttons here. Uh, to bring, to, to learn about other things. You know, you can pick a theme for it, but um, you want to make sure that the kids are connecting art and the environment as well. Okay, so civic engagement. Um, this is one where you guys right now, if you could just kind of like hug yourselves in pride, you're part of this right now. You are a success metric just by being here, by being involved. This is part of civic engagement, a very, very important thing for our community that people get out and they get involved, okay? So our, our goals are having community-based job training, um, bringing those kinds of things in and near our communities, um, having residents participate in government. We have multiple programs in the county where, where residents can become educated and kind of get a little basic degree in everything the county does. We're about to start one um, in just a month or two where you have multi-week sessions where you learn what the county does. It's a great way to, to learn what, uh, what our county government does. We have services available in our neighborhood and community centers um, and always trying to increase our neighborhood organizations. You're obviously one of those, but we want we want more community connectedness, more, you know, bringing people together for the common good of assessing and improving their neighborhoods. So civic engagement, we're looking at the metrics here. Uh, you know, we look at unemployment rates, we look at voter participation, poverty percentage. All of these are just, we're trying to see if people are, are getting out and getting involved, okay? <clears throat> numbers of, uh, I think we have, what was it, 800 or so registered community groups. Uh, I think I remember that um, very large number. The one I'm most proud of is right there in the middle, the volunteer hours, 824,000 volunteer hours um, in, uh, in 2016. I have no doubt that 2017's number is going to be uh, that or more. A tremendous amount of volunteer hours. And that is, believe me, volunteering, as you probably all know, helps somebody else and it helps you at the same time. There's no better feeling than when you're done and, and you've done it. Um, so civic engagement. Okay, so question, why do you think people don't volunteer? So we know why they do, but we're trying to always get better at figuring out why they don't. So not enough time, forgot to sign up, don't know where to help, just don't want to. So this is you kind of thinking for other people. Don't know where to help, I think, is a great thing for us because I, I see that's just untapped potential. You know, people just need a little bit of help. And it's our responsibility and your responsibility as an HOA, since we're all kind of in this community together, um, to try to facilitate that. Find a person who you think might want to do it or drag them along to something. You know, a number of our staff were just out at uh, the mustard seed tearing apart you know, beds and pulling the springs out of them so they can be recycled and, you know, and it's, it's, it was a hot day, but it was a great day and everybody had a great time. Money, okay. Money. What's that? Money, money. I don't think they found it. They didn't tell me about that. They, they did. Okay. So what's the, what do you think is the best way is two shot, two, two for here. What's the best way to find volunteers? Do you think social media, face to face, TV ads, regular mail, email through work? <clears throat> So you're going with the social pressure, man. The, you know, can't say no to the hand handshake agreement there. One thing I can tell you that we've started fairly recently and it worked out well was some of that social media. We were we did a project. You'll see it in your in your note there for uh, a, a pitch it or a don't pitch it, fix it. I keep saying that wrong. Gloria will get me in trouble. And we put that out over next door and pow, we had tons of people. So social media, we're really starting to figure out that can, that can work for us. Okay, okay, very good, thank you. So um, I've talked some, a little bit about getting involved. It's very, very important. There's, you know, the county has 65, 66, 67 at different advisory boards across the board. There's all kinds of things. Get involved with the county advisory boards. <clears throat> Become an influencer in your community. Um, on our county webpage, we have all those opportunities uh, where in your neighborhoods uh, you can help out. That Planner Academy is the one I talked about uh, and the Orange County experience. Uh, the schools have Leadership Academy and we do tour drives every year. There's lots of ways to get involved. I should be pushing these buttons. Okay, last focus area, arts and culture. I'm going to hit this one in two and a half minutes. So our goals are obviously that we need to 
provide funding. We, they, they need help, okay? And so we want to make sure that we're providing um, help to create those stable and well-established um, arts organizations. And arts are such a fantastic, I mean, that, that's like a, an absolute uh, rainbow of opportunities for, for arts. It's, it's, it's so many different things. And um, we want to make sure that, that, our, uh, that our events are well attended. You know, and it might be, uh, you know, uh, an, an art, uh, art exhibit uh, in a particular area of town or around a lake, you know, that you go there and you look at all the different artists or all the way up to one of, you know, I mean, for your children's or grandchildren's school plays, um, all the way up to Dr. Phillips, you know, and some of the more fancy productions that, that go on. But we want to make sure that we are supporting our arts, that we provide predictable um, support for them. We want, <coughs> obviously, an international reputation for our arts, and that we continue to teach our arts in school. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you can see some of the metrics we're looking at. Um, you know, what's the level of funding? What's the predictable, that recurring funding that's out there? Are we teaching our schools, I mean, are we teaching our school children um, about arts with a very varied uh, coursework? And then, you know, how well are they attended? Okay, last question. How many arts and cultural events have you attended in the past six months? This might be the most challenging one. Four or more. Oh. Fantastic. Very good. Excellent. I, I, I don't need to teach you guys anything more about attending the arts. So around the county, there are numerous events. And the important part is making sure that people are aware of them and, and that they provide value. I talked about the, those outdoor, even just outdoor art when you're walking around Lake Eola or even at our county administration building, there's public art pieces outside. If you go walk through our halls, there are public art pieces on the walls. So you've been through them all. I'm going to wrap up just by saying that sustainability for the county and again, that's that quality of life uh, value point there. It's a collective vision of what we want our community to be, okay? And it's a, this big plan is a holistic approach that moves forward at the same time, uh, and it pays off in our economy, pays off in our social well-being, um, in our cultural elements in our communities. It's a long journey. We've got a number of years. Some of the things happen real fast, but some of them take a long time, especially those transportation kinds of things. But it's just the thoughtful decision making is the important part of that, that you sit down and you put together a plan, that you consider all those factors in that plan moving forward. And it requires creativity. Sometimes you've got to break some boxes that you're used to operating in. Uh, you want to make sure that you know, the things that you do float all the boats. You want to make sure that you've got good equity components and diversity components in your plans. And, and we do, and we're very proud of it. So thank you very much. So we've got maybe 15 minutes if you want to ask some questions. Uh, Lori Forsman, who's also here, if I didn't introduce her, County Sustainability Specialist, and she's got a mic. Do you have a mic yet? Um, so uh, if we can get her uh, okay. a mic. And and as we ask our questions, we'll be sure to hand you the microphone, and if you could ask your question into it, that would be great. All right? Yep. So who's our first And no question? filibustering. How do you know I have a leaky toilet? How do I know you have a leaky toilet? <laughs> yeah, you, well, you, you, the, oh. you, you, you indicated that uh, outdoor irrigation was the, the largest waste of water, and then you had the leaky toilets as the next one. But I, I mean, how do you, how do you determine how we're using the water? Well, I mean, just from my own experience, obviously, you, you'll hear that, you know, now your bathrooms might be scattered all around your house. But if, if you hear that, that cycling, it could be that that gasket is just kind of worn out, and we've all probably replaced them in our lives. Also, if you pay attention to your water bill, you might see it fluctuate, and I've, I've had that happen too. So now our utilities division, you know, professionals could probably dive deeper into that for you, but that would be my quick uh, question or answer for you. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I apparently confused you. How do you know how we are using our water? You, you oh. had statistics on the amount of water we were wasting. Well, I, what I was saying was of the budget, of the water budget for a home, our utilities staff have done studies, and their studies show that of the water that we use per capita in our homes, 50% of it is going onto our lawns. And you'd have to ask them for the 
you know, how, how they drilled down into that study. But that's a, I've, I've heard that from other studies too. It seems to be pretty common. I mean, honestly, if, if you can imagine, we all turn our, you know, our, our sprinkler systems come on, frankly, even when it's raining sometimes, and they might go on for, you know, 45 minutes or something like that. That's a significant amount of water, more so than, uh, than you might use with taking a quick shower or things like that. But the majority of our water, or at least that 50%, um, generally is. Now, everybody's a little bit different, but their studies are showing that that amount is going on to our, our water, or outdoor watering. And I would like to also add that, you know, that pie chart, you know, showed percentages, and it's based on whatever your total water usage is in a month, say. Um, that percentage might not change. It might still be 50% of the water that you're using is going on on your landscaping. But that overall number of gallons per day is something that you need to try to be bringing down. And right. maybe you will change the 50% to 45 because you changed the timer on your system. It, it's not necessarily about moving the percentages around as much as it is about taking your total number and bringing it down right. and by looking at all of the items in that pie chart and making sure that you're doing the best to make all of them as small as possible. Right. And it's fairly easy to do when you when you really get into the science of designing your, your landscape. It's pretty easy to bring that uh, water usage down. Um, we had a question in the back. Did you? Um, I was going to make a comment on the water wait. meters. I just want to spread some questions around, and we can we can come back. Sorry, I was going to make a comment on the water meters. You can look yourself if you on the very bottom of it. Mm -hmm. If you see a little black dial that is moving, right. that means you have a water leak or Correct. water usage. You may not even realize that. I learned several years ago from the actually City of Winter Park where I had leaks I didn't even know about. Mm -hmm. And they showed me to watch that. So periodically I'll go out and check the water meter. Right. And if I know all the water shut off and that dial is moving, you've got a leak someplace Correct. I don't even know. You might about. have maybe in the far corner of your home an outdoor spigot that's that's leaking maybe in an area where you don't normally walk and you can you can see those. Um, if we don't have any others oh yes, ma'am. I'll get back to you. I had two questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is uh, one of the reasons that I don't ride the SunRail mm -hmm. is because of security issues. Um, are there any plans to just, I don't know, put some monitors on the SunRail or something like that? And then my second question is, could you tap into the, you know, why did the recycling go down? I know for me and my family, um, our trash pickup went from two days a week to one day a week. Mm -hmm. And although that was very annoying, it really forced us to recycle. Right. And I thought that was a great, you know, just, you know, um, plan. Mm -hmm. I know in Japan, also the way that they um, manage their, their waste is pretty interesting where the government, you know, they, if you have like cer a certain amount of waste, um, you get charged. So it really, um, you know, enforces for the residents to, you know, do compost or recycling. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the government in my personal business, but I thought that that was a great, you know, way to manage their waste. Right. Okay, so I'll try to answer that one fairly quickly. That, that's an answer that will take at least another hour to, to go through. But there's a couple of things that are important, and, and that is that I think that most folks really are dying to recycle. We, we, we want to do it, okay? Whether we really believe that it makes a difference, we, we still want to do it, okay? And the problem is, is people are re recycling more and more stuff that's frankly not recyclable or things that cause problems at our machinery in our in our materials recycling facilities like those plastic bags okay people will put all their recyclables in a plastic bag those plastic bags gum up the machinery and end up breaking it but um, one of the things is that we're having too much contamination in our recyclables and when you talk about that one day a week you know forcing people to recycle sometimes it forces people to kind of put some trash in there too if they don't have uh, enough room but really it's the the, one of the big problems is the uh, contamination, so to speak. Stuff that is in our recyclables that make the rest of the stuff in there unrecyclable, okay? And so getting better at recycling, maybe it even means that you just recycle less stuff, but better stuff, okay? And so that's part of the education program that we're trying to, to, to re, kind of restart the issue of, of recycling. Great that everybody's wanting to do it. And oh, I hope, I mean, we call it wish cycling. We, I wish this could be recycled, so I'm gonna put it in there. Let them figure it out. Hopefully it will be. And then we end up with loads 
going to the landfill of recyclables, okay? And so we're working on that. There are some other problems with, you know, China basically didn't like, you know, when ships come over here with stuff, they take our waste back and they recycle it, you know, or provide it as resources over in China, but our stuff was just too dirty. And they had to say, whoa, we can't take this stuff anymore. It's just too contaminated. Okay, that caused some upheaval in the system and there's lots of other things there. But for everybody in here, the most important part is if you go onto our county's you know, solid waste webpage, it'll tell you there, think five, and it tells you just do these things. Don't feel bad about throwing that other stuff away. Don't feel bad at all. Give us the good stuff and make sure it's clean enough for us to be able to recycle. And then we can kind of get that process going again. Yes, sir. Uh, dealing with wastewater again, is, is there an incentive to get people off of um, city or, or county water into uh, well water? I don't know of any incentives uh, for that, for getting people onto wells. I don't know. I'd have to, I can get your card and I can, I can ask our utilities folks if there's, if there's any push towards that. I would say it's probably going the other way, you know. Um, into bringing people more into public systems but so you're saying that if you have public water you would want to stop paying the or stop that service and get a well or okay okay yeah well there's certainly nothing wrong with using well water um, but I don't know that there's anything out there trying to to get people to let's say prioritize putting a well over the opportunity for a pu the public system that's there I don't think we have any programs in that re in that regard. Did you guys have a question? Oh yes. Okay. Say that question again. Um, oh, the secure safety issue. Okay. Yeah. So I took Sunrail. I was taking Sunrail for a while every day to work because it's only a block away from both ends for me. Um, I didn't. I'm, I'm not sure that they had monitors there every time I was there, um, and they seemed to be at every station. And there's certainly multiple folks on the trains, conductors uh, that are there. So I, you know, I'm not hearing too much of a problem related to that. Now, uh, you know, if probably if you're getting off the train and it's the last stop and the la you know, it's 10 o'clock at night, I haven't experienced that feeling yet. For me, I'm getting off the train at, you know, 6.30 in Altamont Springs. And so there might be other areas where there's some, uh, some concern. And Sunrail does have an advisory board, you know, um, they have staff that, he that take these complaints. There's actually one assigned for each county. I think there's two of them assigned to each county to hear these complaints or concerns and, and to vet them out at their boards. And I can certainly pass that on to the Orange County representative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So we have three internationally known theme parks. A terminal at the airport that's about to open, a new one, and so much new construction on homes. Why are we so behind the times with public transportation? Oh, man. And you said we're only in the thinking stage? I, I, Did, you mentioned earlier that we're only in the thinking stage. Well, what I'm saying is, uh, when, when I'm talking about that, is more so the complete streets, not necessarily those kind of large scale transportation, you know, projects, but I'm talking about the en enhancing the systems that we already have for walkability and biking and, you know, a little bit more progressive ways of using our existing, you know, uh, neighborhood transportation, you know, areas. I can't really answer your question. Uh, just, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been in the transportation planning world, um, so I probably couldn't provide that to you, but we have, I'm sure we have some advisory boards in the county that uh, <laughs> could, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, you know, can't dive back into that. Any other questions in the back? No, just, oh, hang on, the mic gets to you. I don't have a question, I just want to make a remark. Anybody that doesn't think it's important to recycle and so forth and the garbage that people throw away that they could be <clears throat> composting at home and so forth, mm -hmm. um, in Winter Park, where the Winter Park uh, Village uh, shopping area is, that was the Winter Park Mall. Before it was the Winter Park Mall, it was the city of Winter Park dump. Did you know that? Uh, now you go to these dumps, like uh, all these d dumps, 
mountains now around the Apopka area. When they fill up, I mean, they're mountains. Then you see where they've <clears throat> sealed them with the clay and the other material and all, and grass, and now you can see cows grazing on those. Do you really want the milk from those cows? Do you really want to eat the beef from those cows? We need to think seriously about our recycling and what we throw away in the garbage. Um, waste management, they know me because on these new garbage cans, they have a thing on there that no, tells them how often you pick up, or they pick up your garbage can. They know that they don't pick up, I won't tell you how often, but let's just say my garbage cans are not put out there very often and they know it. Well, kudos to you for that. One of the and things, I recycle <coughs> fantastic, fantastic. Teach your neighbors how to do that. So one of the things I can tell you that's kind of an exciting thing that you would not have heard about or won't know necessarily about because there's just a select group of people working on it. We were chosen, the Orlando area was chosen as a pilot in the whole country by the US Chamber of Commerce to study uh, recycling as a whole. There's a national, 34% is the national level for, for recycling, and this, this uh, initiative is called Beyond 34. We want to get beyond 34, and that doesn't just mean 35. You know, we're going to try to, like, you know, a little bit more than that. But we've got groups of uh, business stakeholders. You've got Coca-Cola and Target and Walgreens and the big, we've got those together with consultants, and we're getting some national resources to put together a, or vision out what a strategy will be for our three, four county area. We want to make sure that we create that circular economy if possible with our businesses for our waste and to get the programs that are out there, just like you're talking about, of composting you know, on a more holistic level to try to reduce the amount of stuff that goes into our landfills, okay? And so that's a great, probably a two-year project. We've sort of just started it. We're maybe three quarters of a year into it. Very exciting. I'm part of that process and I'm hoping that it's transformational for our region. Thank you all for being here. Um, this concludes this particular workshop. We want to thank Alan for a very informative and uh, actually fun presentation.